The Taylor series is a beautiful mathematical idea that lets us approximate a smooth function with a polynomial. So here I'll show how the same Taylor series is useful to us in two different asset classes, an option and also for a bond. So in the case of the option, we'll use the Taylor series to estimate our exposure on the option as a function of the options delta and gamma and maybe even vega. So we go from delta normal value at risk to delta gamma normal value at risk. And then that same Taylor series is a mathematical idea. I'll show us using that applied to the bond asset class where we're estimating the exposure on our bond price or bond value to a change in its risk factor, the yield, as a function of the bond's modified duration. But we're going to add the convexity term, which is the second term in our truncated Taylor series. So here I'm showing a truncated Taylor series. By truncated, I mean that with additional terms, this series technically goes on infinitely, although it would just afford us incremental precision that in most cases we don't need. We're just going to pick up the second term here to add some of the nonlinear exposure. So in a previous video in this playlist, I explained delta normal var as perhaps the most common uh, non-simulation based approach to estimating value at risk and I explain that what that means is we have a risk factor that we assume is normally distributed. In the case of a stock option the risk factor would be a change in the stock price. In the case of a bond the risk factor would be a change in the yield. So we'd assume that that yield over a short period of time has a normal distribution and then we estimate our exposure via this transition transmission parameter in the case of an option as delta, and in the case of the bond as duration. But in either case, these are either functions of, or in fact, the first partial derivative. So this delta normal approach is actually using the Taylor series, but just the first term, right? So here we've now gone, if we just use the first term, we would only have really a, a polynomial of degree one, and we would have our linear approximation. But now we're adding the second term. We're going from a linear to a quadratic and a polynomial of degree two. And so we're estimating our change in, the change in value of our position here as a function of two terms, where this first term here is the linear approximation, the first partial derivative evaluated at our the initial value of our risk factor, multiplied by the change in the risk factor, right? So in the case of a bond, this would be the yield, uh, uh, the first partial derivative, which is dollar duration evaluated at the initial yield, multiplied by the change in yield. If it's a uh, option, stock option, this is the first partial derivative evaluated at the stock price, right? That's option delta multiplied by the change in stock price. So that term is giving us the linear approximation but it's leaving out the nonlinear part of that function. And we address most of that gap, not all of it, because we're not going all the way with the Taylor series, with the second term here, which in the case of the stock option, we could call it the gamma term. In the case of the bond, we can call it the convexity term. And so per the Taylor series, which is the math, the beautiful math, not specific to the asset classes, that's going to be a one half here multiplied by the second partial derivative evaluated at the initial value of the risk factor multiplied by the change in the risk factor, but squared. So you see now here we have, now it's a quadratic or polynomial of degree two. two. Okay, so on the spreadsheet here, uh, first I execute or implement that Taylor series approximation for the stock option, right? A simple case of let's just say it's a single stock option and it's at the money where the underlying stock price is 100 and the strike price is also 100. So it's an at the money option, one year term, 4% risk free, 4% risk free rate, uh, dividend yield on the underlying stock is zero. So it's a non dividend paying stock. 
And then finally, I've rearranged the typical order to put the volatility here at the bottom, a volatility input assumption of 30% per annum as usual. So on the left, just to zoom back before I go into the weeds here, all that I'm doing here on the left is pricing this option here, and I'm using the Black Scholes Merton. And if you like, download the spreadsheet, you can see that those are in uh, collapsed rows here. So I'm hiding those or grouping those. Uh, I guess more accurately say grouping. I'm grouping the calculation here, so that's not my point here. But I'm using the Black Scholes Merton to price this at the one year at the money call option. It has a price of $13.75. And then what I'm doing in the next column is I'm just shocking our primary risk factor here, the stock price. And you can see it's a modest shock. I'm saying if what happens if the stock price drops by $2 down to $98? And this is a very simple case. We don't need the Taylor series for this, but I'm just illustrating the simple case. We don't we need the Taylor series only when it gets more complicated. Certainly don't need it here because as I show in the second column, all we need to do is reprice the option with the same model and the call option value would be $12.56. And you can see the difference there is just shy of $1.20. In other words, Stock price drops by $2, so the option price drops by $1.20 per our exact repricing. So we could think of this as a simulation. We are fully repricing, and so this is, this is exactly accurate, at least if our model is accurate. Okay, so the idea with the Taylor series approximation, again, not warranted here if the repricing is so simple, but more useful when the situation becomes more complex, just illustrating the idea over here. With the Taylor series approximation, what I have here is the change in the risk factor, right? That's the $2, so that's not really an input. I'm just borrowing that directly. Right, that's our risk factor, that's the change, that's delta S. And now here we've got the options delta, which uh, again borrows from my calculations, and you may know that that's ND1, standard normal cumulative distribution function. And hopefully you also know if you're a candidate of the FRM that for net the money option, we expect that to be a little bit above a half. So we do expect a, a value of about 0.6. That's the option delta, and you'll notice I've got that notated here. It's also the Strict mathematically, the first partial derivative. Change in, change in value of the option with respect to a change in the stock price. So our delta normal approach, just our delta normal approach, the linear approximation was is very simple, right? It's a negative $2 change in the stock price multiplied by our option delta of 0.165. And that would be the delta normal of R, we leave it alone. Now, in, but in the delta gamma, or we, where we uh, include the second term, I've also calculated gamma also here as a function. Um, here are some of those option grief mathematical functions. It's much lower. And gamma, option gamma is in fact the second partial derivative with respect to a change in the stock price, as noted here. And so with the Taylor series approximation, you can see now I'm just, if you think about this, I'm just building on that first term, which was the delta normal, and adding that gamma term, which follows the Taylor series pattern that we just looked at, right? So I can actually, I'll just go ahead and redo this. For my, first for my delta term, I'm taking the delta and multiplying by the change in the risk factor of $2, and now I'm gonna add the gamma term, so it's one half multiplied by my gamma multiplied by the change in my risk factor, but I square it. And I get uh, roughly $1.20. And I've now incorporated this gamma term. And way to think about this is with the, if I have a, my typical plot here, 
of stock price and call option value. As you know, it's nonlinear. However, it is a smooth function, making it amenable to the Taylor series approximation. And when we did the delta normal bar, or when we just did delta normal, what we are doing is estimating if our risk factor or stock price drops, we're estimating the change per the linear approximation, right? So just to be really dramatic, right? If the stock price drops like that down to here, then our linear approximation, you can see, uh, doesn't explain a nonlinear exposure. So now we're with the uh, gamma term, we are filling most of that nonlinear difference here. And you may notice that in this gamma term, by squaring the negative two, it's always going to be a positive adjustment, right? Which visually comports. My, delt, my first term is going to put us on the line, and then my gamma adjustment's going to plus us up to get us closer back to the actual uh, nonlinear pricing function. And the only other thing I did here, just to show that we have other risk factors, but we can, the Taylor series also, we're effectively applying that with um, when we use Vega. So I can add in here an idea of the volatility dropping. We're long a call option, let's say. So our secondary risk factor really is a drop in volatility. If my volatility drops by 5%, um, then per my Taylor series approximation, I can take that negative 5% drop just as a raw shock multiplied by the Vega, Greek option Vega, which is the first partial derivative with respect to a change in volatility this time as the risk factor. Those multiples here give me um, a term that estimates the change to this option value just as a function of the volatility. And I can add it and get my estimate per the Taylor series. In this case, using three terms, right? I'm using delta, gamma, and vega to estimate per the, ta per the Taylor series approximation. And what I did here is I take the difference here and just show you how it's very, very accurate, even though we've only gone to the second order of the polynomial, right, as a percentage. Our, our, um, we're only 13 basis points here off in inaccuracy. Okay, so finally, just to show you the application, the other classic use case here is to the bond. And so a similar pattern, my pattern is essentially similar here. We have a bond price uh, input assumption. So I'm assuming a bond with a 5% yield, $100 face value, 10 year ter term, 3% coupon. And what I've done is gone straight out and priced it with the Excel present value function. I'm assuming this is a yield with a semi-annual compound frequency corresponding to a coupon that pays semi-annually. So the 3% is a per annum coupon. We always state those in per annum terms, but it's paying every six months. So in this case, it's $1.50 every six months. The price of that bond is $84.41. Again, in this super simple case, we can use the simulation-based approach or fully reprice. And if this case were long the bond, our primary risk factor is the yield and our exposure is to an increase in the yield. So shocking the yield up by let's say 20 basis points, I reprice the bond, right? No sweat there. And I find that the price of the bond drops by almost $1.40. Okay, then the Taylor series approximation, again, we're taking that same mathematical, beautiful mathematical idea and just applying it to a different asset class. Where the key here is that we still do require though, if I think about this visually, right, and we still, here is a yield and there's a price, we still do require a quote unquote smooth function. And, but, but you, do, you probably do know that as long as this bond doesn't have embedded options, like a mortgage-backed security, which would have negative convexity over here at low yields, doesn't really meet our qualifications. So we actually don't really have the Taylor series available to us, but in a vanilla bond without embedded options, we have a smooth function. We can use the Taylor series approximation. 
And when we just use the duration, again, just like in the option, we're using a linear approximation. Uh, we're using the slope of the line that's tangent to that price yield at whatever yield. But as with the option, we're omitting um, the the uh, nonlinear acts aspect, which in the bond context is called convexity, right? As an analog to the gamma in the uh, option. And so here with the Taylor series approximation, we're invoking that same pattern. Change in the yield. In this case, that's just the shock of plus 20%. And I have a duration which is calculated below in the spreadsheet. So this is a modified duration if you're curious. And then my first term of the Taylor series, essentially similar, right? It's the duration as my sensitivity. Uh, that's, my, uh, that's my function of my first partial derivative. And we're multiplying it by the uh, shock to the risk factor, which is the yield. Only difference here is that modified duration is actually what we say infected with price. So it's a matter of the units. The first partial derivative, technically speaking, is the dollar duration. And the dollar duration divides by the price. Let me just put that out here. The first partial derivative is actually, right, if I say uh, valuing that first partial derivative at the yield, is actually modified duration times the price and actually negative because it would have a negative slope. And so the modified duration actually divides that by price. And so our duration ends up being in units. So we have a bit of a, I'm sorry, my duration, the duration here of 8.36 is 8.36 years and is therefore infected by price. In other words, it's dollar duration, the first derivative divided by price. So um, a long way of explaining that the difference here is we're taking the duration times the change in yield. That would give us a percentage, which um, is, uh, forget the dollar sign for a second, that would actually be a 1.7% change to the price as a linear approximation. And so only difference here is I multiply by the price to get a dollar based change, right? Per the formula here. So now I have a linear estimate of the bond price change given a 20 basis point shock to the yield. And it is uh, a, a little bit above a dollar 40, but that's just the linear approximation. So I add the second term now, that convexity that owes its, owes its uh, our ability to use it to that Taylor series, again, per the pattern here. And so I'm again using 0.5 multiplied by the convexity, multiplied by the change in yield, but I'm remembering to square it. And if I just do that, I get a percentage and so I need to multiply that by price to get a dollar amount. And then my estimated change in price per the Taylor is actually negative this, the duration term plus the convexity term. And it's a negative uh, $1.398, just shy of $1.40. And so now this is our estimate or approximation per the Taylor series, including the convexity term. And you can see here also by including the convexity term, I've, ve I've greatly increased uh, the accuracy. It's only 0.0068%, very accurate. And that's why we don't need to go to a third term on the Taylor series approximation to become more exact. But just what hopefully that conveys that this, although we're in the bond context, we're still using the first and two, second term of that truncated Taylor series approximation to estimate the change of the bond price if there's a shock to this primary risk factor, which is the yield. So if you found this video helpful, subscribe to the channel and we'll make sure you get notified of updates. Thank you.